Hey there, welcome to Good Life Online Church. My name is Josiah and it is so good to have you join us here. At the moment, we're in a series called Empowering Presence, looking at the Holy Spirit and asking questions like, what is Pentecost? Who is the Holy Spirit? How can we hear God's voice or even know that it's God's voice? And how do we use these spiritual gifts in today's church? We hope you enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Oh, I love that I get a response and everything. It's good. Um, I get to like continue our series in the Holy Spirit. And to do that, and I can't escape my teacher ways, where we do this thing where we consolidate our learning from the previous lesson. I don't know if there's teachers that are out there who know what I'm talking about. So what we're going to do, we actually get to watch another video because um, there's a group called The Bible Project and they do a really excellent job at, um, through video and animation, kind of addressing different themes and topics that are in the Bible. And they've got this great one on addressing what is the Holy Spirit. And because I know we've got youth and teenagers in today and we might have people who have absolutely no experience with what we call Christian faith, who the Holy Spirit is. We might have people here who've been walking with Jesus for 80 years. So we're all going to get on a little bit of the same level and we're going to watch this video that really well articulates what the Holy Spirit is and then we're going to jump into today. If you've ever heard the phrase, the Holy Spirit, and you want to know what it means, where do you start? Well, you have to start on page one of the Bible, where the uncreated world is depicted as this dark, chaotic place. But then above the chaos, God's Spirit is there, hovering, ready to bring about life and order and beauty. Okay, but what is God's Spirit? Yeah, so the Spirit is the way the biblical authors talk about God's personal presence. The Hebrew word is ruach. Ruach. Yeah, you got to clear your throat at the end. So what is it? Well, ruach can refer to a number of different things, but what they all have in common is energy. Energy? How so? So there's an invisible energy that makes the clouds move or the tree branches sway. Right. Wind. So in Hebrew, that's ruach. Okay. Now take a big breath. So you feel that inside you. Yeah, the air? Well, specifically the energy, right? The vitality in your body that you get from breathing deeply, that too is ruach. And this is the same word used in the Bible to describe God's personal presence. Just like wind and breath are invisible, God's spirit is invisible. Wind is powerful, and so God's spirit is powerful. And just as breath keeps us alive, so God's spirit sustains all of life. Yeah, ruach. Now, as we continue on in the story of the Bible, we see God's ruach giving special empowerment to people for specific tasks. The first person in the Bible this happens to is Joseph. God's spirit enables him to understand and interpret dreams. And then it happens to this guy named Bezalel, and he's an artist. God's spirit empowers him with wisdom and skills. He's given creative genius to make beautiful things in the tabernacle. And we also see God's ruach empower a group of people called the prophets. They're able to see what's happening in history from God's point of view. That's exactly right. And here's the problem as the prophet saw it. While God's ruach had created a really good world, humans have given in to evil. They've unleashed chaos into it through their injustice. A new type of disorder. Yes. And the prophet said the spirit would come, just like in Genesis 1, but now to transform the human heart, to empower people to truly love God and others. How will this new act of God's spirit happen? Well, centuries pass and we are introduced to Jesus. And at the beginning of his mission, there's this beautiful scene where Jesus is being baptized in the waters of the Jordan River. Yeah, the sky opens up and God's spirit comes and rests on him like a bird. This story is saying that God's spirit is empowering Jesus to begin the new creation. And we see this happening when he heals people or forgives their sins. He's creating life where there once was death. Now, Israel's religious leaders oppose Jesus and they eventually have him killed. But even here, God's spirit is at work. The earliest disciples of Jesus who saw him alive from the dead said it was God's energizing spirit that raised Jesus. This is the beginning of new creation. Yes, and it's still going. When Jesus appeared to his closest followers, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And soon after that, the Spirit powerfully comes on all of his disciples. So that they can become a part of this new creation and share the good news and learn how to live by the energy and influence of God's Spirit. And so today, 
The spirit is still hovering in dark places. Yes, pointing people to Jesus, transforming and empowering them so they can love God and others. And the Christian hope is that the spirit is going to finish the job. The story of the Bible ends with a vision of a new humanity, living in a new world that's permeated with God's love and life-giving spirit. Um, so that video for us describes what the Holy Spirit is, and we see it throughout Scripture, how the Holy Spirit is referenced and what the Holy Spirit does. Today, I'm going to share about the Holy Spirit's role in bringing us into communion with God. In that video, you see that the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus' disciples and his followers to transform them, to bring about new life and new transformation in the world. But one of the really beautiful things that sometimes we miss about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the one who also draws us into God and into communion with God, both individually and us as a community. And to kind of talk about this, I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, Theology 101 course for you, really briefly, okay? Because when we talk about God, I don't want to ever assume, or the Holy Spirit, I don't want to assume that you all know what that means. We use this word, the Trinity, often. Hands up if you've heard the Trinity. Yeah. If you've been in church long enough, we sing about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a part of this thing called the Trinity. But for us to truly understand what that even means, and therefore what the Holy Spirit means, we sometimes have to go a little bit back and remember, what does, what's the Trinity? What does that mean? What, when they say that, like, what do they mean by that? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into that. Because in that, what we see is the beauty of what we are called into, into God. So one of the main ways that church, Christian church tradition has tried to explain God is to refer to God as a triune God or the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And we confess this faith. We actually sung about it, and we will sing again um, after the service, after this ends. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Holy Spirit. But this concept has actually been a really difficult thing for Christians to grasp for thousands of years. So if even after today you're going, I still don't get that, guess what? No one still has really ever got it. We try to put words to it, but this is what we call the mystery of God, is that we sit in the mystery of this. But for a little history lesson, it wasn't until 381 AD, there we go, 381 AD, so many, many years ago, 381 AD, that the bishops and the leaders of the church at the time got together at the Constantinople Council, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with, and they decided, <laughs> that is where they decided, actually, yes, the Holy Spirit is in fact equal to God the Father and God the Son. It took 381 years after Christ for those who led the church to come to that point. And they had to do that because there were lots of weird ideas floating around as well about who the Holy Spirit was, who Jesus was, and so they came together. And it wasn't until that point. And then for the next however many years it is till now, 1,800 years or so, 1,700 years, we as the Christian people, as Christians of faith, have tried to also determine what this means. And so sometimes we have um, some terrible analogies about the Trinity, and I will say that I have used these before, where we've say, God is like water. He is liquid, or he could be gas, or he could be ice. Do you know that's actually a heresy that they tried to stamp out in 381 AD? And you're like, ooh, uh-oh, I've been explaining God in a really wrong way. And then you're like, okay, Maybe he's like a clover that has three leaves, but you know, it's one thing. No, no, no. That's also a heresy. You're not allowed to say that. And so you're going, I don't know. How do we explain this? One of the really uh, great ways that I came across is, and there's a picture up here, is when we try to think about God and the Trinity, 
we have Father, Son, and Spirit. It's like a slab of marble. Now, the slab of marble is a slab of marble that can also be a pillar and also a statue that is being carved. It is all one thing, but it is also three separate things. And again, this still doesn't really grasp what we're trying to say about who God is, that he can be Father, Son, and Spirit. But that what we come to is that there's this essence that they are all one. And you're probably sitting there going, why is she telling us this? Who cares? What does it matter? Well, it sometimes matters to come back to actually going, oh, yeah, that's right. We say the Trinity. Yeah, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's important for us to grasp it because actually what the doctrine of the Trinity shows us is that God is a God of communion. God is a God of loving relationship. It is divine communion. And it is the Holy Spirit who is the essence of this and draws us into communion. And so this essence of who the Trinity is, of who God is, this divine communion of love. It's a loving exchange. It's a loving relationship. And this is what we get to be a part of. The ground of all of our being is found in God, who is a loving, communal God. And this word communion, we're going to have it up on the screen and the irony is we have communion today, so it, it works together, and we are going to share in communion. But this word communion today, it's actually understood sociologically and anthropology, anthropologically, there we go, I got it, as not a thing but a relationship. Communion means relationship between one thing and another. And so what we find when we talk about the communion of God, which is the Trinity, what happens within God's self is this communion, is we have presence. Not just physical presence, but this welcome, an offering of oneself. So when theologians talk about the Trinity and, what, and God and communion, they talk about it's this beautiful exchange between God the Father, Son and Spirit, of being with each other and welcoming each other. It's about reciprocity. There's another big word. I'm throwing some big words in today. Reciprocity. It is the movement like clasping one hand to another, the giving between one and another, it's generosity. And we talk about immediacy when we think of communion. It is this union of hearts. It is the formation of community. And so this is what exists within God. This is the communion of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They exist in this beautiful dance of presence, reciprocity, and immediacy. And these are all big things and all big terms to try and get our heads around. But the beautiful thing is, is that because God so loved the cosmos, he gave his son, Jesus Christ, and because of that, the Holy Spirit now welcomes us into this communion. There's an image that I want to show on the screen, and it's this beautiful painting by Andre Rublev from 1425. I want to make sure I've got that right. Yes, 1425. And it's called the Trinity. And you can see three figures there. And what is painted here is God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one is clothed in blue to represent eternity. God the Father has the gold to represent who he is as the author of life. Jesus, the Son, has the purple to represent the suffering and the sovereignty of Christ. And the Holy Spirit there is draped in green to represent life. He is the life giver. Each one is wrapped in wings, showing their presence and communion together, holding each other. But they are sat at a table. And at this table, their hands point towards a chalice, 
Within it is roasted lamb, and it was the painter's way of helping us to think about what divine power, glory, and love looks like. And at this table, this table is not a three-sided table. There is a fourth side, and that fourth side is empty. And the Holy Spirit there, his hand is resting on it. On this fourth side, because this represents what God is inviting us to. Communion, relationship, fellowship with him. The table is open because of what Jesus Christ did and because of the Spirit being sent, we are now invited into God, into communion with him, into relationship with him, and it is by the Holy Spirit that we get to do this. And so then we, if we think about the word communion, meaning presence, we are welcomed by God into his presence. We are welcome to the table. But because relationship requires an exchange, it's a two-way street, we are also given the opportunity to welcome God, to welcome his presence, his spirit with us. He generously reaches out to us by the spirit of God to grasp us and to hold us and to generously give. And we, in turn, are given the opportunity to give back to God. He offers us his presence here and now, the immediacy of God through the Spirit, to know us, to love us. But we are also given the opportunity to know him, to know God through the Spirit, to have our hearts shaped into the interests of God as we come and we sit at the table as we come into communion with God. Paul talks about this, and he particularly talks about it in Romans, in Romans 8, where he writes one of the most profound writings about the Spirit and about prayer. He says that the Spirit groans within us and also prays for us. Paul says that there are these moments where we don't actually do the praying. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. And so the Spirit comes to our aid with sighs too deep for words. And those sighs and groans that we then feel are the result of the Spirit praying for us and praying with us. And in turn, we actually are joined into the communion of the Holy Spirit, the third person of God, praying to God. We're joined into communion. It's a really astounding and kind of mind-blowing thing to think about that once we were not even allowed to come into the presence of God at all, now we are actually drawn into who God is, the very essence of God. He welcomes us into this divine relationship to be with him through his spirit. And so when we think about this idea of the Holy Spirit welcoming us and we welcome him, when we think about giving, the giving of the Spirit to us, but us also giving ourselves to the Spirit, to God, when we think about being known and also knowing, it doesn't actually become just about me, the individual. The very essence of relationship, of what communion is, is it's not about the one individual, but it is about the extension of the welcome to others. And so us as those who are followers of Jesus, who are welcomed into relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, we're also then welcomed into relationship with others. And an example of this is I found within my own life was a few years ago, I was really frustrated. So I've been um, a part of this music team for a really long time. And I don't want to say how long because it makes me feel old, but a, v a few years ago, I got off this stage and boy, was I mad. You know who I was mad at? I was mad at God. I was mad at the Holy Spirit because I didn't feel you. What's happening? I'm in worship, I'm singing, I don't feel you. Are you even here? 
Has anyone actually felt that before? Yeah. And I'm like, we're up here, we're singing. I don't know what everybody else is doing, but I didn't feel you, and I'm off stage, and I'm, boy. And I just said, where are you? What are you even doing? What's the point? You know, you're having one of those moments. And I had in this moment, and we'll talk about hearing the voice of God, but I felt within me, it was like this word, wait. Just wait. And I'm like, nah, don't want to do that. Nah, nope, I worshipped you, didn't feel you, no. And so the service ends, and I'm still, you know, disillusioned with everything. And this beautiful woman from this church sees me, and we just start to have a chat. Now, she is older than I am. She's got grown-up kids. We don't do life together. I don't see her all the time. But we start talking. And my kids were a bit littler. And we just start sharing our life and what's happened this week. And I was, I think, probably had a rough week, clearly. And I, <laughs> I'm sharing about just my girls. And she actually starts sharing about her grown-up kids and that she's also struggling with some things. And we start to talk. And then we pray for each other. And in that moment, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit so profoundly that I walked away and I was like, ah, oh, okay, this is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be in community. This is where the Holy Spirit is right now, in this exchange. Because what myself and this woman were doing in that moment, we were presents. I had welcomed her and she had welcomed me. And we had offered each other this generous exchange. I offered what was happening in my life, she offered something back, and we prayed together in that reciprocity. And then there was this immediacy, this vulnerability of being together. And in that moment, we were joined with the Holy Spirit we felt it, we knew this is what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be drawn into relationship with God is to be in relationship with each other and to draw each other as well into relationship with God. If God is communion, he is presence, immediacy and reciprocity, then we too are called to be presence, to be reciprocity and to be immediacy with each other. Because sometimes I think we think it's too hard and we just want the Holy Spirit to do something for us individually. But what we miss is the beauty that actually God is a communal God. He is a relational God. He wants relationship with us, but he also calls us to have relationship with each other too. And in those moments, boy oh boy, do we know the Holy Spirit. In those moments where we share with each other, the Holy Spirit is at work, at work in us individually and at work with us in this beautiful community. And so we come to the communion table. And here we have a very visceral, physical experience of communion with God where God once again, and this is no more sacred than having this relationship between each other or if you're driving in the car, but this is a beautiful physical moment we take where we are intentional. Sometimes I think it's not really just about going, where are you? But sometimes we actually have to stop and be intentional to seek him to hear the Holy Spirit. And we get this opportunity now at the table where there is presence, where we are welcomed to the table. The Holy Spirit welcomes us, but we also have this moment to welcome the Holy Spirit. We get this moment to recognize what we have been given we take the bread and we take the cup and we physically have them as this, as this reminder of what we have been given, but we also get the opportunity to give of ourselves back to God.
and say, here I am. And then we have this immediacy where the Holy Spirit meets us here and now and says, I know you and I love you. You are loved. You are welcome at this table, but where we also get to say, I love you and I want to know you, God. Would your Holy Spirit continue to draw me into relationship with you? And the Holy Spirit is so beautiful and gracious to us that he continues to transform us into the image of Christ. And so we're going to take this time to come to the table. The band are going to come up and they're just going to play. We're going to grab the elements. But I hope that you might in this moment as you get up out of your seat and you physically walk to the table and you take the bread and the juice, that you would take the moment to say, God, I welcome you. God, I give myself to you. And God, I want to know you. Because the Holy Spirit will meet you there. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you have a spare moment and want to stay up to date, it would mean a lot if you could follow us on social media or even subscribe to our YouTube channel. It all helps in getting the good news out there. Peace.